I know you're asking yourself, hey, what's he doing here? Well, I'm making your wishes come true. That's what I'm doing here. This is not your ordinary reality television show. This is more like super reality. Because best wishes is where your dreams come true. Now somebody has to pick those wishes and that's me. But Jeff Marder here. Yeah, I actually see them through. You know, Ringo, we never really define what seeing them through means. Well, are you telling me that when I found out that Rick Carpenter wished to go skydiving, you didn't jump at the chance to jump with him? Well, all right, I'll admit it. Rick is braver than I. I mean, he did make the wish to go skydiving despite the physical challenges of being quadriplegic. That is exactly what makes his wish so extraordinary. Rick wished for something larger than life. So, how did we surprise him? It was breakfast, which is the most important meal of the day. Mm -hmm. His uncle Will and his friend Eric, they had lured him to the restaurant. I made believe that I was doing a breakfast survey. Uh. I had the camera hidden, and I thought I had the perfect way to surprise Rick. Hi, good morning, gentlemen. Hi. Uh, I'm doing a little breakfast survey here. I'd like to find out what you're eating for breakfast, and uh, I'm going to start with you. Do you always eat breakfast? Yeah. You do? Always? Do you like to skydive before breakfast or after breakfast? Before. Always. Before breakfast. Well, then I don't think there's any need to order breakfast, because what we're going to do is we're going to take you skydiving. I'm Jeff Marta from Best Wishes. Nice to Are meet you. Are you serious? I'm really serious. Oh, get out! <laughs> oh, Jack Teddy, Rick. <laughs> yeah, except it's not a joke. We're actually going to make your wish come true. Okay. okay, man, I'm very serious about this now. You can either eat or you cannot eat. But we have to get ready and go skydiving. Today? Today. We're jumping from 12,500 feet. <laughs> <laughs> You're excited? Very much so. All right, Rick, let's roll. There's a lot of things in life I really wanted to do. And... Uh, Skydiving was pretty much the thing on my wish list that I hadn't done. After I broke my neck, I didn't think it would ever happen. Before his accident, Rick's life was filled with adventures. He had learned to scuba dive, parasail, ski, and more. Last on his list was skydiving. Today was the day he would fulfill his ultimate wish. I broke my neck three years ago. I was up on a shelf and I slipped and fell and hit my head. So now I'm quadriplegic. I, I can't grab things or walk. Ringo found the perfect jump school that specializes in extraordinary skydives. The instructor, Jay Schumacher, explained that they would be strapped together for the jump. This is the harness that I'm going to have you wearing. Okay? The harness is basically the same as what I'm going to have on. This is the back of it. There's no parachute, so it's real important you make sure you're hooked up to me before you leave the airplane, okay? Being in a wheelchair now, in some regards, has heightened my search for adventure because you learn to trust everybody around you. So I'm very excited to skydive. I mean, it's something that I've wanted to do for years and years. Go ready, set, go. I'll, I'll do almost anything. Once. Okay, what I want you to do, bring your head all the way back, bring your arms all the way out like this. Or Robert's position. Okay, after about 50 seconds of free fall, when we get down close to 5,000 feet, I'm going to let you know by tapping you on the shoulder. Now, while we're in free fall, it's going to be real noisy because we're going 120 miles an hour. You're not going to be able to hear what I'm saying. Okay. Now, is he not going to be able to hear you because of the wind or because of his screaming? Probably a little of both. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm just going along because I have the Thomas guide. I have to fold that map back up while we're in the plane. Yeah, right. You're going. Uh, I think I hear the phone ringing. You're going. Uh, I think I hear my beeper. You're going. Girl Scouts can do this. You can do this. Yeah, but uh, I'm no Girl Scout. So I wasn't going on the jump. I mean, someone had to be on the ground to fold up the parachute. Yeah, everything that I've always wanted to do is just sort of falling into place and it's working and when I saw the opportunity you know to submit a wish and it was something that I always wanted to do and I was on this incredible roll I thought geez I better grab it now while I'm on the roll
about to just jump out into this nothingness. And that's when the fear started kicking in, going, geez, this is not a guaranteed thing. kind of rolls up and you don't know what's up and down uh, all your reality parameters are just shot and then once you kind of stabilize and you're looking down and you just got that wind you, you feel like those dogs in pickup trucks that stick their heads out you know <laughs> just like flapping in the wind I don't, you mean this big brown thing? Big brown circle, right. You've got this 360 degree unobstructed view. 1,500 feet. And you can look anywhere and just see anything. It's quite breathtaking. This is really wild. It was fun. Unbelievable fun. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Unbelievable. I, 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 you can't describe it. The first step is always the hardest. I'm very glad I made the wish. Hey, this is Jordan Wheeler, and he's five, and his wish is to be on television. Let's go. Hey. There you are. Now you're on television. Okay, that's enough. Take us to the commercial. Don't stop wishing. We'll be right back. Great. Not everyone makes a wish for themselves. Gene Sudi from Colorado made a wish for a family he'd never actually met. You see, Gene is a Vietnam veteran. When Gene came home, he got on with his life. It wasn't until many years later that Gene found out his captain and close friend, Frank Adams, had died in Vietnam. And then he started writing to Frank's family. You know, Ringo, when you told me that it was Gene's wish for Captain Adams' family to go to the Vietnam Memorial Wall and see Frank's name, I didn't realize that we'd be taking Gene there, too. Well, when you make a wish for someone else, something good always comes back to you. It was early in the morning when Gene and I went to the wall in Washington. Gene wanted to pay his respects before Frank's family arrived. They didn't know that Gene would be there to meet them for the first time. Having only exchanged letters and photos over the years, Gene was anxious to finally meet them. It's hard to describe the friendship you had over there because that was basically your family at the time. Captain Adams had got assigned to Golf Company in January of 69. The special thing about him was he was so honest. He explained that he'd normally flown spotter planes and he wanted to get some infantry experience on his record to help him in getting a promotion but he had never done basically what he was volunteering to do and, and he needed some help to learn how to do it. It was not an officer enlisted relationship. He'd sit and have beers with the guys. Whatever we ate, he'd eat. The morale was always good. You never thought of him being in the rear. He was always out with you. When you left the place, you always thought of everybody that was there when you left as alive. He was out flying a spotter mission south of Da Nang. 
You know, I always thought if he was going to die, he would have died with us in the infantry instead of flying a plane. Looking for a way to say goodbye, Gene had reached out to In Touch, a Vietnam veterans organization, and found Frank's family. I got a letter from his mother. The woman really missed Frank, and I think looked forward to hearing things from me, and we just became close. Frank's daughter, Melanie, started writing me. Uh, and then uh, one day I got a letter from his nephew, little Chris. My wish for, for Gwen and Melanie and, and Captain Adams' family is for them to come out and, would, to come out and see the wall uh, on the day Frank died. We brought Frank's family to the wall from their home in Tennessee on the 23rd anniversary of his death. Gene's wish for them was about to come true. It's 23 years ago today that he was killed. I was at work. My son walked in. He said, Mother Frank got it yesterday afternoon. He would have been home that weekend, and we had a big party plan at the KC Club, and car, new car bought for him and everything. But uh, that was it. He died when I was eight, and it was right around April Fool's Day. I denied it for about four years, thinking that every April Fool's Day he was going to come home. And I think at 12, I finally realized that he really wasn't. I can't believe that uh, Gene made this wish for our family. You know, he knows how much we enjoy our, his letters, and I'm sure he probably enjoys ours. He's part of our family. As he waited to surprise the family that morning, Gene was filled with emotion. He didn't know if they would recognize him or not. Oh, it's Gene. It's Gene. <laughs> It was great to see Gene. It was great to hug Gene. It was almost like we'd known each other. All I know of him is from photos and letters, but I was reconnecting with family that I had back in 68 and 69. You okay, Mel? Gwen, you okay? <sighs> Fifty-eight thousand names on that wall. I'm proud he's on it, cause he fought for this country. For Frank's sister Sherry, meeting Jean and getting to the wall gave her comfort after 23 years of doubt. I wasn't certain that when Frank was there, that every day wasn't just pure drudgery, misery. But Jean gave us stories that told, you know, the the light-hearted side of some of the pranks and the jokes. So I know Frank still had, you know, some fun. He's given us a little peace of mind that we didn't have before. Both look like babies. Except his ears stick out. <laughs> because he had a lot of brains pushing around. Telling the stories is part of uh, what they call a healing process. And it makes me happy to give them a smile or give them a laugh. He was really an awful lot of comfort. He just told me everything that I had wanted to know and couldn't find out. The wall, it's a healer. It's helped us, you know, realize, you know, about Frank and, you know, what he did. It's really special. I'm so thankful that it's there and knowing that people go, that he's not there all alone. Gene's wish had become more than just a wish for a trip to pay respects. It had become a journey to healing and peace. Being there on the 23rd, uh, the day that Frank died, was an added experience of meeting the family. And then the other thing that I'll always remember is where we met at the wall. And I think that'll always be very special to me, having both of them happen where they happened. <laughs>